preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you, Dan. The idea for tonight's discussion began with me at least during the presidential election campaign of 1988. At that time, it seemed to me that public intellectuals, however one might define them, were taking a remarkably small part in the goings-on, either as direct participants or as expert commentators. This curious desuetude struck me as a contrast to the past, going back at least to the 1950s. It also struck me as an anomaly considering that a good argument can be made that one of the remarkable features of American life over the past few decades has been the prominence and even the numbers of public intellectuals. And so it seemed natural to wonder and to ask tonight's group of remarkably bright and articulate public intellectuals just what the state of their breed once was and is today. Our speakers tonight are Richard Sennett, Norman Pudhoritz, Hilton Kramer, and Peter Brooks. Before I go on to introduce them, which I shall do for each just before he begins, I would like to offer, however tentatively, my own short and doubtless insufficient definition of these two terms, intellectual and public intellectual. I am doing so not to lay down the lexicographic law, but to provide a disposable benchmark, which these gentlemen surely will find inadequate, but I hope suggestive. For me, an intellectual is someone who lives usually, but not always professionally, by the employment and communication of words, ideas, symbols, and images. A public intellectual is an intellectual who goes on to make his work and thought available to a wide audience, thereby gaining a platform for the application of his work and thought to general questions, and a platform also for the making of moral and ethical statements in areas not directly related to his original competence. The ground rules for tonight's discussion are as follows. Each speaker will talk initially for approximately 10 minutes. After each is spoken, they will have a chance to respond to what has been said. This discussion should take some 15 minutes. At its conclusion, I shall ask for questions. As I said last week, questions, I pray you, not statements from the audience. Our first speaker tonight will be Peter Brooks. He was educated at Harvard, London University, and the Sorbonne, and now is Tripp Professor of the Humanities and Director of the Whitney Humanities Center at Yale University. Professor Brooks is the author of several influential books, including The Novel of Worldliness, 1969, The Melodramatic Imagination, 1976, and Reading for the Plot, Knopf, 1984. He has been a contributor to Partisan Review, The New York Times Book Review, The Nation, and The New Republic. A recent and striking example of his work as a public intellectual has been his collaboration in the writing of the much-discussed 1989 American Council of Learned Societies report, Speaking for the Humanities. Professor Brooks will speak tonight on the idea of the intellectual in Europe and America. Professor Brooks. Thank you. I think that the happy spectacle of playwright Lachos Havel's move from jail to the presidential castle in Prague may effectively dramatize the difference in the public role of intellectuals in the United States and Europe. We don't, on the whole, put intellectuals in prison, and we never elect them president. The closest we've come to a playwright president was a movie actor, and his scripts were all written for him. Now, Havel, I think, stands in a tradition of European intellectuals who've acted as guardian and shaper of the public conscience, at least since the French Revolution raised the ideological stakes of politics 
There have been public intellectuals in Europe of a kind that American culture seems unable to produce or to tolerate. We recall that in the revolutionary crisis of 1848, for instance, France turned to a poet, Lamartine, as president, president of the New Republic. And in our own time, we can recall the prestige, even the glamour, of the politically engaged intellectual of post-war Europe, the enormous public influence exercised in France by Sartre, Camus, Marvaux, in Italy by Salone and Moravia, or in another vein, the impact of Brecht's Berliner Ensemble. Conversely, we recall that one of the relatively few people to be tried and executed by the French for crimes of collaboration during the war was the writer and editor Brasillac. Europe in these years was as much a contest of ideas as of parties. One might reflect here, as Hilton Kramer has recently done, on the role of the Congress for Cultural Freedom and its periodicals in the struggle for the mind of post-war Europe. Intellectual life entailed a sense of responsibility and of risk. Now, certainly New York intellectuals, starting in the 1930s and very much in the post-war moment, tried to play a similar role of avant-garde public conscience not necessarily to a mass audience, and that never was necessary for European intellectuals to be influential, but to a reasonably identifiable and coherent urban intelligentsia. I'm thinking most of all of the role of the quarterlies, particularly Partisan Review, in shaping a politics of modern culture. But then something happened. Intellectuals on the left succumbed to the tensions and contradictions of the Cold War, the McCarthyite years, the increasing commercialization of culture beginning in the Eisenhower era, and then the inchoate challenges of the 60s. The best and the brightest brought into power by President Kennedy seemed to be only too eager to deny their university backgrounds in order to play macho games of realpolitik. In retrospect, these years may mark not the rapprochement of power and intellect, but their increasing divorce. I think these years also marked a widening gap between a dwindling number of public intellectuals and an increasingly professionalized core of university intellectuals. Here, I think we really come to the core of the problem. The universities, which became a phenomenal growth industry in the 50s and thereafter, have taken over too much of the intellectual and even the literary and artistic talent of the country while at the same time other organs and agencies of intellectual authority and its dissemination seem to have withered. The burgeoning of the American university was accompanied by the decline of traditional urban culture, by which I essentially mean New York culture, for the complex causes of which we're all aware and which are ever more visible in our daily life. The universities gathered within them poets, novelists, painters, composers, architects, as well as philosophers, critics, and theorists, and they now tend to see their primary audience as students and colleagues in a national and increasingly global academic network, which is itself full of vitality, but is often insulated from the extra academic public. The problem is not that academics are too specialized, as they're often accused of being, but that they have little incentive and less opportunity to engage in the kind of public discourse that would allow them and force them to mediate between academic and public culture to, to perform acts of translation. In part, this is because what the French would call the intermediate organs of culture seem on the whole to have fallen into decadence along with the urban milieu from which they sprang. Who reads the quarterlies anymore? Who even reads those once important mid-cult magazines such as Harper's in the Atlantic? I suspect that the descendants of their audiences now find their culture on Channel 13 and at the exhibits mounted by the Metropolitan Museum in the Modern. Certainly our culture has become intensely visual. At best, this means the continued vitality of many New York creative enterprises, especially painting and dance, and at worst, when it enters the realm of discourse, such pseudo-publications as Connoisseur and Vanity Fair. 
I think there's never been an important modern intellectual movement without a periodical of some sort, however ephemeral, however ephemeral, to represent it, to give it voice and presence. Of course, we still have the New York Review of Books, but I suspect that its circulation is largely supported by an academic audience, just as its advertising pages are largely filled by the university presses. And though it's spoken well on important cultural and political issues, it never has really developed a coherent group of writers with an identifiable program. For one thing, its stable has been too much filled with English bombs for it to be consistently pertinent to issues in American cultural politics. As a result, the people I see daily, students and teachers, tend to find their most interesting periodical reading in such academic journals as Critical Inquiry, Representations, October, Yale Journal of Criticism, rather than Partisan Review, Hudson Review, or The New Republic. The academic journals have in particular been in the forefront of discussing new thinking derived from European philosophical models, from psychoanalysis, anthropology, cultural critique, film theory, worked at the French lump under the heading of the sciences of man, about which the public periodicals have been largely dismissive or else silent. The writing in these journals is, of course, often abstruse and difficult precisely because it does not have to hold itself to standards of public responsibility, but it can also be important. Now, the exceptions to this stark and, of course, insufficiently nuanced tableau are represented by two of the members of this panel, Hilton Kramer and Norman Podhoritz, who edit the two most successful current journals of public intellectualism. Commentary in the New Criterion have, a cor have of course, staked out neoconservative ground in cultural politics and in politics to court, which now seems to be the almost exclusive preoccupation of commentary, leaving distinguished cultural critique largely to the New Criterion. The stance of both magazines began in opposition to an apparently dominant liberal culture, especially in the arts, but in fact, we can see in retrospect that they came into being as the tide was changing. Their stance was on the way to becoming majoritarian, and they managed, I think, to be a not insignificant part of the Reagan revolution. So that we had the phenomenon, which I think is quite rare in American history, of a cultural elite deeply attuned to the ruling political elite and with agendas that effectively joined politics and culture with polemical verve and even messianic passion. I think it's fair to say that on the whole, commentary in the new criterion have won their battles. Their politics are dominant, and their cultural politics, if by no means wholly shared by the arts and letters community or by the university community, have been widely backed by the official guardians of culture, by the National Endowments for the Arts and for the Humanities, for instance, and by many university administrators who are trying to reshape institutions on what I would in shorthand call Alan Bloomian lines. I must say in tribute to Messrs. Kramer and Podhoritz that I wish the other side, my side, had journals as lively and as influential as theirs. But I disagree with them on most issues, and in particularly find their attitudes towards the liveliest areas of thought and learning in the universities deplorable. I have the impression that they are consistently hostile and dismissive towards the very movements that are revitalizing the humanities today and that deserve wider public circulation. I will end by asking what, what are the chances of a revival of public intellectuals of a more liberal persuasion and more inclusive interests. That question, it seems to me, entails the whole matter of finding a way for intellectuals, largely in the academic world, to go public. The organs for them to do so, including, of course, the financing of such organs, and their will to do so. R.P. Blackmer once said of Lionel Trilling, perhaps the last public intellectual of the type I should like to see revived, that he cultivated a mind never entirely his own. That is, a mind that tested itself against the texts and artifacts that it was interpreting and against the public cultural discourse in which it had to participate. 
much of what now passes for cultural, public cultural criticism seems to me mere polemic or taste-making. It needs a renewal of that sense of the critic as mediator, as interpreter, who, as the word interpretation itself tells us, speaks between, someone who can connect, reconnect the private acts of the imagination with public concern. Is this possible? Can the decline of American urban culture be replaced by other forms of common intellectual life? I confess that I'm not optimistic. I remain unhappily persuaded that it is hard to find a true public intellectual in the US today, and persuaded also that this is not a good thing. Thank you. I'm tempted to uh, drop my role as moderator and <laughs> say that I say that I I I hope that what Professor Brooks has said is equally true both in his praise and in his strictures. Our next speaker <laughs> will be Hilton Kramer. Mr. Kramer was educated at Syracuse, Harvard, Columbia, and Indiana universities. In the 1960s, he was the editor of Arts Magazine and in 1966 became chief art critic of the New York Times. In addition to his work, I'm, I'm sorry, in 1982, he became the founding editor of the New Criterion. And in addition to his work at the New Criterion, Mr. Kramer is the art critic for the New York Observer and a regular columnist for art and antiques. His books include two collections of criticism, The Age of the Avant-Garde, 1973, and The Revenge of the Philistines, 1985. Mr. Kramer has contributed on many occasions to Partisan Review, Commentary, and the Times Literary Supplement in London. His subject tonight will be public intellectuals who have come out of literature and the arts. Mr. Kramer. Uh, inevitably, uh, my... Uh, views of this, uh, of this question that's before us this evening will be somewhat different from uh, Professor Brooks's. Um, I expect there'll be an opportunity uh, later in the evening for me to address myself to the question of this overwhelming success he has attributed to the new criterion. Um, a um, a charge the, enough to make uh, the gods howl. Uh, but um, for the moment, um, I want to put before you some observations of a quite different kind. We are obviously living at this moment in one of the most extraordinary uh, historic changes that any of us will observe uh, in a lifetime, or indeed in many lifetimes. The uh, collapse of the communist movement, the revelations of the degradation, uh, sheer chaos, that communism has brought to so many societies now has been laid bare uh, for the world to see in a way that no public intellectual, despite his best efforts, could have made as clear in the past as history has made it uh, clear to us at this moment. It therefore seems an important moment for us those of us who are concerned with the role of intellectuals and with the moral history of intellectual life and for particularly the moral history of those public intellectuals who have felt so free and have been and indeed have received such large responses from their um, the energy that they've addressed to uh, public questions. It seems an important moment at which to look back, 
particularly to those intellectuals who have come out of the literary and artistic worlds, and see what it was that, for the most part, they were urging upon us, what positions they took about our society and about the adversary societies that were opposed to our own. If we think about this moment from that perspective, we're really in the presence of a rather grim tale. If we go back, say, no further than uh, Lewis Mumford and Edmund Wilson uh, in the older generation, or to um, Norman Mailer and Susan Sontag in what I guess uh, would have to be described as a younger generation, though no longer a young generation, uh, and go down the uh, history of the names that come immediately to mind in the um, literary and artistic worlds, um, Dwight MacDonald, Mary McCarthy, Allen Ginsberg, uh, Paul Goodman, Alfred Kazin, Irving Howe, uh, Leonard Bernstein. We will agree, I think, whatever else we may disagree about, that what governed the outlook of this company was the myth of socialism. It could be framed differently, it could be otherwise defined, but basically it was the myth of the left. The, the myth that stipulated that to be an intellectual was tantamount to being a left intellectual. To be an intellectual was to be a socialist. To be an intellectual was certainly to be an anti-capitalist. To be an American intellectual was to be anti-American. These, these were the basic credentials of being a public intellectual in American life, certainly from the time of the um, Armory Show in 1913 until just the other day. Um, if indeed we can say that the day has passed. And when we look back at the content of what these left thinking public intellectuals uh, consisted of, it's remarkably dismaying Lewis Mumford, for example, who was certainly one of, uh, let's say, the more virtuous of the company, a man who, at his best, had quite extraordinarily brilliant things to say about the architecture of our century and what was wrong with it, but who yet somehow upheld through all that brilliant architectural criticism, upheld the idea of a pastoral metropolis, an oxymoronic idea that could only have been put forward by a writer for the New Yorker magazine who left New York very early on in his career as an architectural critic to live in a very backward country town. It was never anywhere acknowledged in Mumford's architectural writing and all those blasts at what was going on in Manhattan, how much he hated it. And how eager he was to repair to the village of Armenia, which I tend to think of um, I've been through Armenia. Um, I tend to think of it as anemia. The ideal of a pastoral metropolis 
actually was a specialty of the New Yorker magazine in its heyday. There was E.B. White living out his nervous breakdown in Brooklyn, Maine, offering weekly homilies as to how we should conduct our lives in Manhattan, at the UN, in the world at large. Nobody thought it was funny. There was Edmund Wilson, whose politics, and Wilson is a writer I greatly admire, but whose politics were hopeless, deadbeat, from the recycled socialism that was the foundation of Axel's Castle, the book that everyone of my generation was brought up on, and which didn't seem to really have any politics until you reread it, to Norman Mailer, who I believe made his public debut as a public intellectual in the Kremlin-sponsored Waldorf Conference in 1949, in which he did a very daring thing. He actually uh, offered what I, uh, the f uh, for the first time, I believe, what would later be called uh, a judgment of moral equivalence between the United States and the Soviet Union. This was still in Stalin's day, in which he said that since both countries were dominated by what he called state capitalism and the only solution to the problems of the modern world were socialism, um, a third force had to be uh, established. It was a period, remember, in the 50s when in Europe there was a lot of talk about a third force. But perhaps Mailer's most famous offering as a public intellectual in his early years was that never to be forgotten essay called The White Negro, in which at the very beginning of the disintegration of um, urban life in this country and indeed in this city, he offered an existential justification to young hoodlums beating up shopkeepers. This was the utterance of a public intellectual operating under the myth of socialism, and many other myths, of course. And of course, in those days, we were just beginning to, he beginning to hear from Allen Ginsberg in his first emergence as a public intellectual in the beat culture, afterwards to be greatly amplified and magnified in the counterculture of the late 60s. And what was it that Allen Ginsberg brought to culture, brought to society as a public intellectual? Well, nobody talks about it much anymore, but he brought us the celebration of the drug culture something that we're greatly suffering from today. Somehow the provenance of the drug culture in our society doesn't interest the media, doesn't interest intellectuals, doesn't interest social analysts much anymore. Where did this drug culture come from? <clears throat> it came from Allen Ginsberg and his friends uh, who proselytized, who offered it up as a kind of <laughs> ideal uh, emancipation of consciousness. Uh, looking around the audience, I can be reasonably confident that there are many people here tonight who remember that that was Allen Ginsberg's role. That was the role of a public intellectual who saddled us with something really terrifying. This is what the literary world operating under the um, imperatives of the left offered our society as wisdom, as standard, as guidance, as goal. And when we think about that, the content of that, 
and of course, one could go on to uh, to a much vaster inventory of of such uh, recommendations and uh, goals. When we think about that in relation to the events that have overtaken the, pol the international political scene today, I think it's important to feel a certain sense of shame. I think it's very important to feel a sense of betrayal. I think it's very important that we ask for an acknowledgement of what has been foisted upon us. After all, these are figures who rose to great heights of celebrity. Uh, the, the favorites of our great cultural institutions on the basis of ideas that proved to be absolutely lethal both to ourselves and to others. And when I think about this situation, I very, it very often comes to mind a text uh, which certainly a few people here tonight have heard me on other occasions invoke. But I feel compelled to refer to it once again. And that is the extraordinary essay that John Maynard Keynes read to his Bloomsbury friends in the 1930s about himself and about them called My Early Beliefs. And among the many other penetrating things that Keynes, who to say the least and by his own word, uh, did uh, not pretend to have lived a morally perfect life. Among the many other things he said to his friends were, we were immoralists. We never gave sufficient thought to what a thin, fragile crust civilization really is. We took toward it a completely aesthetic view. And this is where it has brought us. Now, there's a lot to ponder in Keynes's My Early Beliefs. But more than 50 years later, what is most impressive and depressing to me is that not a single one of the public, of the left public intellectuals that were responsible, writers, artists, so many others, so many other creative people, hardly a one has come forward with the kind of mea culpa that Keynes had the courage and the dignity to lecture his friends and colleagues with, his dearest. Perhaps it has something to do with the, um, the dignity of British intellectual life in that period that we're unfamiliar with. Perhaps it has something to do with the individual moral conscience of the person. We, it's be hard to know exactly why, but where is the accounting of what took place? Thank you. Our next speaker will be Norman Pudhoritz. Mr. Pudhoritz was educated at Columbia University, the Jewish Theological Seminary, and Cambridge University. At Cambridge, he was a student of F.R. Leavis and taught English literature. Since 1960, he has been the editor of Commentary. Mr. Pudhoritz's many books include Doings and Undoings, 1964, 
Making It, 1967, Breaking Ranks, 1979, The Present Danger, 1980, and The Bloody Crossroads, 1986. Mr. Podhoritz has been a syndicated columnist appearing here in the metropolitan area in the New York Post, and has been a frequent contributor to the op-ed page of the New York Times. Mr. Podhoritz's subject tonight will be, by what authority do public intellectuals speak? Mr. Podhoritz. I'm, um reminded in addressing the question of uh, authorization of a story an old friend of mine once told it's a true Jewish mother story he had uh, moved to New York from a small town in the Midwest and uh, had accumulated a number of uh, abstract paintings in the days when abstract paintings were rather less familiar than they later became, and on a visit to his apartment, uh, his mother looked at the paintings on the walls and stared at them and stared at them and shook her head and finally turned to her son and said, who authorized those pictures? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, who authorized the intellectuals to speak up on public issues about which they often know little and care less. By what authority have intellectuals taken it upon themselves to lecture the rest of us on questions that are vital to our own lives and to the life, the life of the communities in which we live? It's fairly clear from the writings uh, of intellectuals who have addressed themselves to public issues that they tend to regard the source of their authority in their own qualities of mind and character. They tend to regard themselves as more intelligent, more honest, more observant, more perceptive than most people, including most specialists. And they tend to believe that simply by focusing their gaze on a particular segment of reality, they will discover in it uh, truths that uh, lesser or more cloddish mortals are incapable of seeing. Yet the curious fact is that so many such intellectuals have shown themselves to be not more intelligent, more honest, more perceptive than most people, but consistently stupid, dishonest, and incredibly credulous, particularly in relation to the pieties of the left, whether those pieties are enshrined in ideas or embodied in other societies. Peter Brooks mentioned the best and the brightest of the Kennedy administration and said that they tended to forget their academic origins and occupy themselves with games of realpolitik. Well, that was true of some of the intellectuals in the Kennedy entourage, but it wasn't true of all of them. Let me take as an example John Kenneth Galbraith, who served as an advisor to Kennedy, having, of course, been a professor of economics at Harvard for many years. Uh, and was uh, also ambassador to India during the Kennedy years. Uh, Galbraith has the distinction of having been uh, wrong to a degree that boggles the mind, both on China 
and the Soviet Union without himself being a communist. That is, his being wrong cannot even be excused or justified by a commitment to the uh, beliefs that animated those systems, those countries, when he visited them. Uh, the words are important to bear in mind, and I, here I want to add uh, really a, a sort of documentation to the charges that Hilton Kramer made. Uh, and I've got a few juicy quotations here. Uh, China, the whole world is outraged by Tiananmen Square and by things that have gone on recently in China. Although, uh, in terms of the bloodshed and the degree of repression, recent events are as nothing compared to what happened uh, during the reign of Mao, particularly in the Cultural Revolution, as everyone, including the Chinese leaders themselves, uh, now knows and acknowledges. But here's what Ken Galbraith said in writing about that society back in 1973. Somewhere in the recesses of the Chinese polity, wrote Galbraith, there may be a privileged party and official hierarchy. Certainly, it is the least ostentatious ruling class in history. So far as the visitor can see or is told, and note, the visitor can see. He's relying on what he himself saw, and he, uh, just to digress, in the same uh, book from which this quotation uh, is taken, he specifically ridicules the idea that he could have been fooled by any Potemkin villages. There was no Potemkin clever enough to kid Ken Galbraith, who was too well informed. So far as the visitor can see or is told, Galbraith went on, there is for worker, technician, engineer, scientist, plant manager, local official, even one suspects table tennis player, a truly astonishing approach to equality of income. Clearly, there is very little difference between rich and poor. Even at that time, uh, some scholars knew that the discrepancies between rich and poor in China were immense. And uh, this was a time when uh, millions upon millions of Chinese including most Chinese intellectuals, were being murdered or otherwise persecuted. Uh, very little of that seems to have penetrated to uh, the honest, the fearlessly honest and perceptive gaze of John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, 1984, what is that, five years ago, just about the time uh, Gorbachev came into power, toward the end of the reign of Brezhnev, following the, the reign of Brezhnev, which uh, everyone in the Soviet Union from Gorbachev on down now declares to have been the years of stagnation, of disaster, of a, an economic crisis so deep that uh, there's some question as to whether the Soviet Union can ever pull itself out. Here's what Galbraith said that the Soviet economy has made great material progress in recent years is evident both from the statistics and from the general urban scene. One sees it in the appearance of solid well-being of the people on the streets, the close to murderous traffic, the incredible exfoliation of apartment houses, and the general aspect of restaurants, theaters, and shops. Partly, the Russian system succeeds because in contrast with the Western industrial economies, it makes full use of its manpower. <laughs> should one weep? Should one cry? Should one howl? I haven't seen Ken Galbraith's reputation significantly damaged by the culture in which the new criterion and commentary are supposedly triumphant. Uh, Eastern Europe, the whole world, is exhilarated by what is happening in Eastern Europe. And many people who were not particularly notable in their anti-communist sentiments when the communist regimes were dominating the countries of Eastern Europe uh, seem to be taking credit for these uh, changes. Uh, here is what Paul Samuelson said. In one edition of his textbook, Economics, that textbook has gone through about 100,000 editions, I think. 
In one of those editions, about 10 years ago, uh, Samuelson, echoing a sentiment that was quite widespread, by the way, among intellectuals, declared, quote, it is a vulgar mistake to think that most people in Eastern Europe are miserable. This is a textbook, incidentally, that is used by practically all students of economics uh, in the American University. Let me, uh, because I wrote a book about Vietnam, and because uh, I think that uh, the scandalous statements of intellectuals during the Vietnam War have yet to be taken account of, and the mythology spread by those intellectuals still remain regnant in the popular culture as we see from uh, the success of one mendacious film after another. Vietnam is another good example of uh, how intellectuals authorize themselves to pronounce on difficult public issues. Because in addition to being more intelligent and more honest and more perceptive than the rest of us, intellectuals also have tended to regard themselves as what the late Michael Harrington once called a constituency of conscience. They are more moral, or at least more idealistic, uh, than the rest of us. Their moral sensitivity uh, gives them a feel for the moral truth uh, beneath the surface of any reality they deign to inspect. And it is their direct experience that serves as sufficient evidence for their moral pronouncements. Here is a Susan Sontag writing about North Vietnam during the Vietnam War. She was providing us with so idealized a picture of North Vietnamese society that she stopped herself at one point to wonder whether Perhaps she wasn't falling into the old trap of uh, what she herself described as Western left-wing intellectuals idealizing an agrarian revolution. And of course, she quickly dismissed that idea as unfair to herself. Uh, and she said, uh, it's true that, uh, that uh, this is a cliche, but I must reply, quote, that a cliche is a cliche, truth is truth, and direct experience is, well, something one repudiates at one's peril. In the end, I can only avow that, armed with these very self-suspicions, I found through direct experience, again, direct experience, what she herself saw, North Vietnam to be a place which, in many respects, deserves to be idealized. North Vietnam, which uh, the, the whole world now recognizes as one of the worst most repressive Stalinist regimes in the communist world, as it was at that time, she described as a society, this is her language, tremendously overextended ethically. Incorporation into such a society, she said, would greatly improve the lives of most people in the world. Tell that to the boat people. She, like the late Mary McCarthy, who wrote in similar terms about North Vietnam, had things to say about the captured American pilots who were being held there. We now know that those pilots were tortured and that when they were paraded before visitors, uh, they were terrorized uh, into behaving as though everything was okay. We have much testimony to the effect now. No one doubts it. Here is what Susan Sontag said about the treatment of those prisoners by the North Vietnamese. She said, uh, the, the only thing wrong, by the way, she could find with North Vietnamese society was that it had an unfortunate uh, tendency to be puritanical in its sexual mores. Apart from that, it was perfect. Uh, and she wrote, 
The North Vietnamese genuinely care about the welfare of the hundreds of captured American pilots and give them bigger rations than the Vietnamese population gets because they're bigger than we are, as a Vietnamese Army officer told me, and they're used to more meat than we are. People in Vietnam really do believe in the goodness of man. Mary McCarthy, just to finish up with this, there are so many quotes here that I, I'm afraid I don't have time for them all. Having seen a couple of captured American pilots who uh, seemed to her to be talking in a kind of rote and mechanical way, perhaps they'd been drugged, she thought, and then she thought, oh, well, no, that's not possible. If these men had been robotized, I felt, it had been an insensible process starting in grade school and finished off by the army which had turned them into somewhat pathetic cases of mental malnutrition. These are uh, fairly characteristic examples, I would say, of the moral sensitivity of intellectuals uh, who have pronounced on some of the public uh, issues of our time. So I will simply conclude by saying that uh, if Peter Brooks were right, which unfortunately he isn't, in saying that we have no public intellectuals in this country, uh, we would be very lucky indeed. <laughs> Our last speaker will be Richard Sennett. He was educated at the University of Chicago and received a PhD from Harvard. Both a sociologist and a cellist. He was a founder of the New York University Institute for the Humanities and is university professor of the humanities at NYU. He has been a guest scholar at Clare Hall and King's College, Cambridge, and in 1977 delivered the Sigmund Freud Memorial Lectures at the University of London. Professor Sennett has also been directeur d'études at the École des Hautes Études in Paris. His many books include Families Against the City, 1970, The Uses of Disorder, 1970, The Hidden Injuries of Class, 1972, The Fall of Public Man, 1977, and Authority, 1980. Also a novelist, Professor Sennett has written The Frog Who Dared to Croak, 1982, An Evening of Brahms, 1984, and Palais Royale, 1986. He has written for the New York Review of Books, The New Yorker, and Partisan Review in the United States, The Times Literary Supplement in Great Britain, and Le Monde, Tel Quel, and Minuit in France. He will speak tonight on Dilemmas of the New Public Intellectuals. Professor Sennett. I'd like to thank you, first of all, for uh, uh, doing such a liberal thing, may I say, is inviting uh, somebody whose who's, uh, politics are so different from your own to, uh, to speak. Uh, I thought I, I would like, if, uh, if you permit, to, to change a little the, uh, perhaps the, the tenor of our discussion and to talk a little about that word public. Uh, not to talk so much about intellectuals, but to talk about what uh, a public realm is, what it means to be in public. Uh, and I, I'd like to preface this, um, I, and I, get, I can tell you very simply the gist of my re remarks, which is that there is, in my view, an indissoluble uh, association between certain ideals that we have uh, of public life and uh, what I believe are, are certain re real virtues of liberalism, that the word liberal and the word public are inextricable. They can't be taken apart. And to explain that, I guess I, I, as a, a preface, I should say that I, I, I feel that the um, demise, if, if we can call it that, or the fading of those liberal ideals um, is is, poses a grave public problem for us in really constituting a kind of public discourse in a public realm for ourselves. I, I don't agree much with uh, scholars like uh, Louis Hartz who see uh, the con 
kind of con constituting of our own history as a nation as having aimed over a long period from the late 18th century up, up until the New Deal at constituting this thing called liberalism. To me, it's, it seems like something pre um, we may look back on it in 100 years as a 35-year period from, from 1933 to 1968, a certain kind of ideal that prompted by extreme economic and uh, social uh, distress that was rather unusual in our history. Uh, so that it's fading is the fading of something rather uh, uh, brief and I think also rather, rather noble. Uh, uh, I want to explain to you why I think that the words liberal and public are indissoluble. Uh, I th and I think the best way I, way I can say this in a kind of programmatic way is to say that a public realm, as I understand it, and as I understand it having had a life in Western civilization, is a realm in which uh, people's differences uh, don't become reasons to reject each other. That is to say that it's possible for a community of people to live together and, and be unlike. Uh, if I can put this a little more finely, that people can live as strangers to one another's understanding and still constitute a community. Um, and the, you, you see why immediately I will say that the public and, and liberalism are indissolubly joined. That was the ideal, and I think the noble ideal, of uh, uh, the domestic kind of liberalism that we knew in this country, which finally found a voice in, in, in the New Deal, that it would be possible for a country of incredibly diverse, of incredible diversity, not just religious or ethnic, but also in ages, geographically, of language, and so on, that these people could constitute a whole. Uh, in the history of of Western European social life, uh, the kind, that kind of sense of being able to live as, with others as a stranger to them, uh, being able to live with people who are different, had a rather older and somewhat different history. And I, uh, I think the simplest way to explain it is to give you an example of how it would have worked, uh, how public life would have operated in a place like an 18th century coffee house. Now, these were not milieu just of intellectuals. They were places of exchange in cities like London and, and, and Paris to a lesser degree, in, um, uh, which were really the kinds of places of, of informational exchange in the city. They were the origin of insurance firms like Lloyd's of London, which was originally a coffee house. Uh, and in order for this kind of information about the city to be exchanged by people in coffee houses, they had to suspend, they had to enact a kind of fiction that they couldn't, by looking at somebody else, know who they were. Although they were by clothing, there were people in the 18th century still dressed in sumptuary laws who could tell who someone was easily by looking at them. There were kind of codes of speech that allowed people to talk very freely to strangers in a kind of fiction of being able um, to talk openly with the suspend, suspending of rank and so on. And anybody who went into a coffee house knew that that was the kind of experience they were going to have. That was a public realm. It was a realm in which people behaved as strangers to each other through a kind of fiction in order to do something very concrete, to find out in these new growing cities what other people were thinking, what was happening in the city, and so on. Um, if you were to trace, as I have in some of my books, the devolution of that kind of public realm in the 19th century, look at the difference between 18th century coffee house and say a 19th century cafe. In the 19th century cafe, you only talked to people you knew, or people you knew to be people like yourselves. For the first time, uh, the notion of strangers dealing with each other through silence became something that in, in these kinds of institutions uh, uh, arose. Uh, I guess what I'm saying to you is the following, that behind the kind of curious flowering of liberalism in our own culture is a kind of European setting for creating a, um, a, a public 
which has to do with the ways in which uh, social differences become accommodated and respected. Uh, and I think what happened to us in uh, the 20th century is that these practices, which were very, be became increasingly troubled during the Industrial Revolution, suddenly became shifted to the domain of politics for us rather than everyday uh, social life and social practice in cities. And it may be one of the reasons that that liberal experiment lasted uh, such a short time. Uh, but I suppose I, I think it's valuable, not only in the sense that we remain a society of enormous difference, and that difference has to be dealt with. We have to, we have to find a way to live with people whose needs and understandings are strangers to our own. But it seems to me also that, the, that uh, people grow very much from that experience of difference, that no human being really becomes complete by becoming merely living in a community which is self-sufficient unto itself. Uh, and for that reason, I, I, um, I, am, I don't want to speak to all these questions of personalities and, and so on. But I would say that, uh, that for me, the waning of that, that particular strand of liberalism is quite tragic. And uh, what I see as an intellectual project, if you like, are ways in which, given the ter terrific differences that exist in our society, and I'm not just thinking of things like poor, rich, black and white, the differences of age, all sorts of immigrants we never account like Asians, you know? We have a society continually filled. Uh, we're very diverse. We're a very complex society. That somehow we must find a way to renovate that public project of making those people feel that it's important to be with, uh, be with one another. Uh, and for that reason, I don't know if this really answers the question you posed us. But it's for that reason, it seems to me that the, the role of being in public and of finding a kind of public life really has to involve us in a continuation and indeed an elaboration of, of those liberal ideals. Thank you. I'd like to ask each of you whether he has any comments, any brief comments uh, that seem to be relevant right at this moment. Uh, uh, based upon what, what you've heard from each other. Uh, perhaps I start with you, Professor Brooks. I guess I, I wanted to make a comment or, or remark to basically to Norman Podhoretz. Um, it seems to me that your remarks really demonstrate to me once again how public intellectual life in the US was destroyed by the Cold War uh, and brought to a kind of intellectual meltdown. If still in the year 1990, the only subject that we can talk about in a debate about the public intellectual is how people lined up at one time or another in the debates between uh, uh, American democracy or various forms of European or Soviet socialism, we're in hopeless shape. Uh, we're even more impoverished now in the 1950s when these questions at least uh, uh, had a more menacing reality than they do today. Uh, sure, one can find stupid remarks from intellectuals on both right and left, uh, but the point is if you frame them all in terms of such, uh, such dire questions, you're losing the whole point of an intellectual, which is the quality of reflection that should be brought to issues, not simple drawings of lines, not, uh, not reducing choices to their uh, most banal dimensions. Oh, Norman? Well, one of the reasons that uh, we seem to be arrested in uh, this particular issue after so many years is that no proper accounting has ever been made by the left of the positions it took up until uh, five minutes ago, and uh, in some cases uh, uh, beyond that. 
uh, it is impossible to get anywhere. Uh, this is not exactly a, uh, a peripheral issue. It's only the central issue of the 20th century. Uh, it has involved the moral and intellectual passions of every thinking person on the face of the earth. Uh, it, uh, it is not for nothing that it has uh, remained alive because it has affected uh, life on this planet uh, to a greater degree than any other uh, issue and uh, has probably caused more death than any other issue. Uh, so that um, uh, it does not indicate anything like a banalization of intellectual life that we should be preoccupied by. What it does indicate is the uh, hopelessness uh, that at least uh, I sometimes feel about getting beyond uh, ABC on these questions. Uh, if people, uh, I mean I myself have uh, said a lot of silly things and made a lot of mistakes and I have tried in public to deal with those mistakes as best I could. Um, and that's all I would ask of anyone else, not that, uh, that, that, that he be always right and uh, always be proving that he was right. Uh, but it is because we haven't had that kind of accounting uh, that uh, we remain mired in uh, confusion and, uh, and, uh, and bitterness uh, and, I think, demoralization. Hilton? Uh, I'm, I'm interested in uh, uh, Peter Brooks's re uh, remarks about the Cold War and how, you know, uh, dismaying he finds it, and I'm sure many others find that even in as, as late as 1990, we're still, as it were, hung up on these Cold War issues uh, and can't get past them to the quality of thought that we should be properly uh, concerned with in intellectual life. But I wonder if, as a uh, scholar of French literature and French history, you would uh, feel it proper to say that in uh, 1830 or 1848 or 1870 or um, in 1914 that uh, one of the problems of French intellectual life is that people were still hung up on the revolution uh, and that we couldn't get past our obsession with the French Revolution to really make our way to the quality of intellectual uh, uh, thought uh, 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 somehow separate from the revolution. Now, some of us um, feel that the Bolshevik Revolution and the... Um, system that Stalin, uh, Lenin and Stalin uh, uh, put into place uh, really occupies as much a central role in uh, the history of 20th century civilization as uh, the revolution of 1789 does in the history of France. Professor Brooks, would you like to, before I call on? Well, just briefly, I think that uh, if you look at the history of France, post-revolutionary history of France, there are creative and uncreative responses to the revolutionary tradition. And very often, uh, the breakthroughs are, are defined by those who have a more creative and a less, how shall I put it, repetitive uh, attitude towards the original revolutionary tradition. And I think that's exactly what we face in the United States. Uh, where, where are you going to be if indeed uh, Perestroya works, Glasnost works, and we move towards some uh, not not global liberal democracy, but an effacing of the differences uh, which you seem to uh, say we need in order to thrive. Let me let me give give Richard Senator a chance to get into this if I could. You'll get. No, I, I, you want to Hilton? Do you want to? Well, where will I be if it all works out beautifully? Uh, in paradise, I suppose. I don't think we're in imminent danger of it. Uh, nobody would be happier to see it realized than I, and I would happily give up all the intellectual complexities and qualities in the world to see paradise established in this 
um, veil of woe. But, but I don't think we're in any danger of it. The, what, what, I'm, what I'm amazed at is the reluctance to uh, grapple with the fact that this is not ancient history, that this is the central issue of the 20th century, the issue that has cost millions of lives and suffering beyond our wildest calculations. I think, I think Richard Sennett deserves a chance here. <laughs> he wants to jump in at this moment. Use the microphone, will you please? Right. Uh, well, well, maybe I would pose this a, a little differently to you. It's, um, I guess it's a question about what, what you see as, as, um, as, as value. What would you like to have happen, say, in thinking about something like the evolution of painting now or of sculpture? Um, I mean, I'm curious about what kind of, what kind of, where this will take you in terms of, of the things you, you love. Would, uh, what kind of art would you like to see made now? I know that's a very programmatic uh, question, but, but um, I mean, there, there is, this work of criticism is, 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 this, is this what you really want to focus on, or is there some, do you have a vision of the kind of art you'd like to see made well, I'm not quite sure I grasp the the connection between your question and, and what we've been discussing, well, but in uh, answer to your question... Oh. Um, <laughs> I I'm, could tell you the connection. <laughs> I'm, I'm obliged to say that as a critic, yes. I feel it a point of um, honor and duty for critics not to pronounce on the future of art. I think critics, their proper function is to deal with what artists create and not attempt mm. to legislate what they should or might or will create. Could, could and I, so I really decline the question. Could, mm. I, could I jump in here for a minute and say that it, it, it seems to me that uh, Professor Sennett has raised a question that I think does reasonably arise out of the discussion so far. Does the very conception public intellectual mean a political intellectual? That is, is there any kind of public intellectual discourse? By that, I mean not an inward-looking discussion, but a discussion for a wide and educated audience about serious intellectual matters. Is there any possibility of public intellectuals doing this outside of the political arena? Is that, it seems to me. Yes, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't find, um, I don't think you believe your answer to me, and I don't find it, uh, is, you can take a liberty with a friend, uh, and uh, I don't believe it either. I, I mean, I think part of the whole project of, of doing intellectual work is always looking at something that's not there. And uh, whether you're a critic or an artist, that, that, that project is always there. It's always a project of imagining something that ought to be there. And um, that's what I'm, what I'm asking you, Hilton. What ought to be there? Well, it's certainly true of any critic that uh, if he uh, examines what is going on, he's likely to be uh, only too vividly aware of what is missing. Right. Uh, but I think that's a really a different um, question than, than whether one should work out a program for what one would ideally like to see um, uh, artists do. Uh, what would I ideally like to see artists do? I'd like them to produce work of the quality of uh, Rembrandt and Poussin. Uh, <laughs> Uh, every day, in every way, uh, more Beethoven, uh, more Bach. Uh, we all know that that's a hopeless uh, idea. And uh, in any case, what the future of art holds is in the hands of artists. It's really not in the hands of critics, and it's not in the hands of public intellectuals, or indeed of intellectuals of any kind. Let me, In make, my view. let me make an absolutely hopeless attempt uh, and uh, push this a tiny bit. Uh, Peter Brooks, do you think 
that there is a public intellectual domain that is not primarily political. Oh, absolutely. I, I was trying to urge that, that putting public intellectualism purely in terms of stark political choices uh, destroys intellectual discrimination. Well, can you, can you give some examples? I think we, we've, uh, we need some examples, especially we need examples um, uh, uh, that, that to go outside this, this political world. Are they so easy to find? I don't think they're easy to find in this country, uh, and particularly not at the moment, because it's very hard to work out of the cultural domain into the public well, domain. I cited, I cited Trilling as the last person whom we probably all could agree was a public intellectual in that his discriminations about aesthetic problems, about literature, were always connected to moral concerns and always connected thereby to large social concerns. And the mediations between these different realms were very subtle, very carefully worked out, but always present in everything he said and wrote. Well, let's, let's go maybe beyond Lionel Trilling. The only reason I think we ought to go beyond Lionel Trilling is that there's probably a lot of disagreement about that, that as Lionel Trilling is seen as political. But, but do any of you want to, uh, that is, the point I'm trying to make uh, here, I'm trying to get at is, is there such thing for Norman and Hilton as a good public intellectual? Well, I can't. Honesty forbids. Um, I, uh, well, but exceptions are very important. Well, I can remember uh, as long ago as the uh, 1950s, to refer to ancient times, uh, that terrible Cold War period, uh, when in the art world, for example, most of the discussion uh, of uh, painting and sculpture was uh, non-political. Uh, that is, the, the most of the most serious discussion was not uh, was non-political, even though a great many of the people who were writing the criticism had um, came out of a Marxist background. Part of their um, immersion in aesthetic issues was a kind of um, uh, way station in their exorcising uh, to whatever degree they could the Marxist poison from their systems. Um, but no sooner was that discussion uh, codified in largely non-political terms than the 60s came along and the 70s and 80s and a whole literature came into existence that turned around and said, oh no, that discussion wasn't non-political. That was part of the Cold War. It was part of the effort that Nelson Rockefeller and John Foster Dulles made uh, to provide a kind of cultural arm of the Cold War. Uh, this actually began in uh, London in the 50s with John Berger uh, writing in The New Statesman about the first Jackson Pollock exhibition in London in which he said, uh, this isn't the exact quotation, but it's pretty good pricey, uh, this is the artistic equivalent of John Foster Dulles' foreign policy, something that Jackson Pollock would have been astounded by, I'm sure. Well, then, then if there was a public intellectual discussion in the 50s in art, uh, Richard Sennett, what, what do you think? Is there, is there such a discussion possible now? I, I have to say that I wasn't quite convinced when you asked for a, um, a discourse in a public realm now, a discourse which in some way would be an evocation of difference. I'm not sure. Isn't that a political statement also, only a modulated and uh, complex political statement? Well, I don't know. You know, I think about these things in very concrete ways. I mean, how do we get an architecture, for instance, which, uh, I mean, very simple things. Uh, we're suffering, a, you know, from a kind of a, a loss of the art of making cities and public spaces in cities, making pl well, places Well, was Buckminster like Fuller then a public intellectual Hardly. in a laudable sense? No. Well, I'm, I'm looking for examples. Well, I... Um, if you're thinking about urbanism, I mean, people like Constantinos Daxiatos, who rebuilt uh, much of Istanbul and much of uh, uh, much of modern Athens, although 
that's had its problems. Um, <laughs> Uh, there are a lot of attempts by people who are not particularly well known to constitute. Let me just finish what I'm saying. Here. I mean, if you think about a public realm, not as a realm of you know where only people who are intellectuals inhabit, but that some of the virtues of of that kind of discourse, that kind of give and take, are things that 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 are important for everyday social life. Then I, I, I do think of a project in which criticism and, and the making of things and the criticizing of them really have to do with the reconstituting of the city. Now that's very parochial. That's what I happen to be interested in. But uh, it seems to me uh, uh, that that's a project which you could say is political, but it really has to do with everyday experiences of feeling that one can inhabit a world outside one's office, one's house. and. Uh, it, it has, it's social, it's also psychological. So I, I, when you put it in those very abstract terms, political aesthetic, I don't make too much well, sense. Well, I'd like to get it point. out of the abstract terms. I'd like each of you, I, I hope the audience would, 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 would find this interesting, I'd like each of you to put up one or two relatively young people who are you're something close to your ideal of a public intellectual, say someone under the age of, oh, 50. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Just make that one. I missed it. Uh, Peter Brooks? Well, the whole thrust of my argument is that there aren't any uh, in, in this country. I think you're more likely to find them in European culture, uh, where I think a certain visionary intellectual project uh, is more readily understood, where it fits into the public discourse, where a visionary architect, for instance, or uh, even a visionary uh, uh, sociologist can build models which are un understood to be critical models uh, which create a dialogue Foucault, around them. Uh, well, yeah, well, Foucault Foucault is, is yeah. one example. well, then, though he's older than is. 50, certainly is Solzhenitsyn a model yeah. of this? <laughs> no, I shouldn't think so. Actually, I think there are very few novelists who are intellectuals, uh, particularly not in this country. They're, they're, they're more uh, in the European tradition. Kundera would be an example, for instance. Hilton, what, what would you put up? Who would you put up? If well, I, I would find it astonishing to, to characterize um, Solzhenitsyn as not being an intellectual. One could say that perhaps he's too much of an intellectual, no, but, I don't, I don't like but um, um, uh, as for the uh, uh, figures under 50, um, I think it would be uh, invidious for me to single out any one of the distinguished younger contributors to the new criterion. Um, <laughs> But I think that there is a now a serious problem for writers or intellectuals of the younger generation who aspire to deal in a public way with large public issues who are not part of the established left culture. Uh, because they are, for the most part, are pretty much shut out of the realm of public discussion. And I think I know whereof I speak, having myself written for a good many of these publications in my day. Um, the there, there simply isn't the point of entry for as, as many. There isn't as much of a welcome for conservative or, or at least non-left, non-orthodox liberal um, people, intellectuals, writers, uh, artists who write, who have those views. Um, the mainstream intellectual culture, the mainstream media culture, the mainstream academic culture is a left liberal culture that is extremely intolerant of non-liberal anti-left views. 
And so it's a real crisis as to how a rising generation of uh, non-liberal, anti-left intellectuals uh, can make their voices heard except to each other. Norman, do you have any mini heroes at least? No, well, no editor who had any sense at all would <laughs> single out an individual. Uh, uh, no, I, I pass on the naming of names, but at, at the, um, uh, but let me take a, a different kind of risk and say that, uh, look, uh, <clears throat> some of us just sit around and turn out a magazine every month, 12 times a year, in which we attempt to um, engage in uh, and, uh, and promote uh, the uh, discussion of public issues uh, for a general, that is a non-specialist audience, a wide variety of subjects, uh, paying very close attention to the quality of reflection, uh, to the quality of prose, uh, uh, and uh, uh, making an effort to uh, tell the truth as we see it on, uh, on contentious uh, questions uh, that arise uh, all the time. Uh, uh, I think um, the effort, uh, if I may say so, is a, a successful one in an ongoing sense. Uh, as a collaborative enterprise, it, it keeps alive the uh, tradition of, uh, of public uh, discourse for a general audience on public issues. Uh, and uh, the very fact uh, that um, we have uh, such difficulty in uh, reaching a wider audience in universities and uh, certain other such circles uh, seems to me uh, 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 confirmation of the general point that, that Hilton was making. Richard Sennett. Well, I'd like to re respond to that as well. I, I think you've, uh, um, you've maybe got the wrong, um, you've got the wrong antagonist there, and it's a, it's a very large subject. I don't know how, how we can get into it in a short time, but that is the incredible effect that universities have had on intellectual life. And what I say, I say as somebody who has benefited, it's paid my bills, it pays my rent, and uh, I've, I'm a creature of it. Uh, I think that on the whole, academic, the academicizing of intellectual life has, has been a, a, a very negative force and in very concrete ways that have nothing to do with the political culture of who is uh, teaching, but rather have to do just the way with the way universities operate. If you're going to really uh, be just and fair to your students, you must give them, you can't share with them your own doubts. You can do it up to a point, but they're basically there because you have something to teach and they have something to learn and that's there's a discipline that has it's to be it's a revolutionary statement isn't it yeah, well yeah. but the deficit of of that is that what it tends to do is create knowledge which becomes teachable knowledge you've all read the kind of novel which has obviously been generated in a in a writing workshop the discussable novel you know the kind of thing i i mean uh, this is proliferates in, uh, uh, in, in other areas as well. Uh, the problem is that there are very few ways to make a living other than, other than teaching. And the amount of risk taking, that go, academia is an extremely conservative, uh, in the bad sense, an extremely conservative uh, thing. Young kids don't take risks in the books they write because they're afraid they won't get tenure that they'll be unsound, that, that most horrible of crimes. So that oftentimes, just at the ages when people have got the most creative vitality inside themselves, that's when they, they learn all these you know, techniques of disguise and caution. Now these aren't political in that sense, Hilton, but they are profound uh, breaks on the whole capacity to do the kind of self-doubting, you know, to dwell in, in you know, Keats's negative Capability. Well, then, what did, that's that is that is an institutional change in in our society that has diminished, I think, some of the quality of of, uh, of intellectual life, uh, and and makes it something that becomes very I don't know uh, sectorized, uh, very something that you you know you have a position which is something you teach which you represent. 
You don't have that kind of surrender to not knowing what you're doing and spending six months, you know, thinking about it and writing a book. You, the, it's a different, that, that's a different set of forces that diminish intellectual life. Well it's, then, is it possible to say that the contemporary deficit in public intellectual life is really a deficit in intellectual life? that how can people be public intellectuals unless they're first intellectuals of some grip yeah. standing? Are you authority? saying you'd make a distinction between being an academic and an intellectual? Well, well I, I certainly say. think that has to be <laughs> yeah. made. Um, mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that we're How about really being a scholar and being an intellectual? Would you make that distinction? Well, uh, yes, if I... Uh, Yes, I, I, I would. I would I'm not think supposed to ask the, you the question. No, no, that's fine. I, I would. I would <laughs> think that the intellectual is a person of something wider than merely scholarly competence, no matter how great that competence is. I mean, the real question it seems to me we're talking about is whether intellectuality in itself is some kind of aptitude, some kind of ability which has been used to win professional standing in one area and then can be used elsewhere. Um, I'm rather, I'm surprised at two things out of this discussion before we, we come to questions from the audience. I'm surprised that there is so little good to be said by anyone about the intellectual class or the public intellectual class. I'm also surprised, and this is a narrower area, but I think an important one, by the fact that no one has as yet mentioned the curious situation of scientific intellectuals. We've had mm. a discussion here tonight pretty much Good about um, a world going from novelists, artists, playwrights to economists. So we've gone, in other words, from the arts to the social sciences. But we haven't anywhere talked about scientific intellectuals, and if indeed science is so important in our lives as it is, and scientists do science, aren't, isn't the whole subject of scientific intellectuals a subject that we ought to at least pass by with, with a nod? Well, the fact is that insofar as, as most scientists in this period have acted as public intellectuals, uh, uh, they've acted in much the same way as the, uh, the intellectuals that Hilton and I were talking about, for the most part. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure, for instance, that the record of scientists in America during the Second World War is quite the bleak picture that, 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 that we would have put, even, even with people like like Oppenheimer. That is, there's a whole world of the Lawrences, the Tellers, the, um, uh, uh, the Comptons, uh, the Conants. Uh, th th there's a whole world that was quite different. Man like Conant, for instance, he was a very important public intellectual. Um, I guess what concerns me here is that when we look at the television set now, we see scientific public intellectuals all over the place. And I wonder what standards we're applying to them. We're applying pretty tough standards to the literary intellectuals. What about the scientific intellectuals? Are we really talking about scientific intellectuals most of the time or about specialists, which is something rather different? American society and the media love specialists, but they're trotted in to do their thing. Carl and, Sagan? And, yeah, well, no, that's something else. Uh, but they're not really expected to be intellectuals in that they're not supposed to make connections between their specialty and the larger moral questions of society. Well, is that the way you well, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, I think, is. read uh, this? Uh, Helen Caldicott? I, I think she is talking about raising the uh, well, they, uh, important moral issues. That's true. But they usually come at that through some specialty which they have already right. established in one discipline or another. No. I, I think you put your finger on something very, um, very important. I mean, you know, it's a much maligned book, the C.P. Snow, The Two Cultures, but it, uh, it, it has a certain truth to it. Uh, and... Um, I mean, again, coming back to the question of how would an intellectual life evolve in our society, I think one of the ways it would have to evolve, which is, would be very uh, difficult for all of us, is that I don't mean some of the political attitudes of science, but actually what scientists do in their work would come to constitute for us uh, uh, part of an intellectual discourse. I'll give you an example of this. We, uh, I have a colleague at NYU who is a brilliant neuro 
uh, physiologist who has just published a book on consciousness. Uh, it's a book I can read a half page of. And that half page indicates to me that it's a very important book which I'll never understand. That's a kind of, um, I read Freud all the time, you know, I want to read this book. That's another kind of, if you think about, you know, stepping outside, uh, or not stepping outside, but just looking ahead as to what, how an intellectual culture could evolve, somehow that has to be overcome. And that, I guess, ties back to what you were talking about last week, since nobody learns any of... of uh, well, my, my impression, my, yeah. my, my private impression, is that the scientific intellectuals are just as, as heir to the frailties of the intellectual world as anyone else. I remember at the end of the 1960s, a great scientist, a great uh, biological scientist who has received mm -hmm. the greatest prizes, said to me that he had a solution for the coming problem of the world, which he felt to be overpopulation. Well, what's that? And he said, oh, we have to put birth control substances into the drinking water. Yes, well, I mean, there's always nonsense. But I mean, the, the point well, about this is that I don't think I don't think in the way we um, constitute what we think of as an intellectual culture that the actual work that would, say, go on in physics or mathematics is something any of us really takes in. I think you have a very good point about this. and maybe I'd like to go to questions develop. from the audience now. Uh, put up your hand. Yes. Uh, it's you in back. Yes. Well, the the um, I don't know that there's a neoconservative line exactly on uh, on uh, this issue. Uh, insofar as there is one, I would say that uh, it takes the form of opposing. Um, Roe v. Wade on uh, legal and constitutional grounds and uh, advocating that, uh, that the, the issue be returned to the state legislatures uh, so, that, uh, so that it can be worked through the political process. As Roe v. Wade is seen uh, by, I think, most neoconservatives as a prime example of judicial usurpation of powers that do not belong properly to the courts and particularly on an issue about which there is no consensus, to put it mildly, um, the uh, system we live in uh, provides for uh, a resolution of the conflict in a variety of jurisdictions and, uh, and through a variety of, uh, of compromises and accommodations. Uh, now, there are many traditional conservatives, and I suppose some neoconservatives, who are absolutely opposed uh, to abortion and who would advocate a constitutional amendment forbidding abortion. But I don't think uh, many of the so-called neoconservatives support that particular position. So um, uh, it's conceivable that there would be some strain between the two groups of conservatives uh, if Roe v. Wade is overturned. Yes. Underextended cowards uh, who have come to power in in, in government, uh, etc. Uh, what 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 of the uh, what of the re remarkable presence in, in power of dozens of men who managed one way or another to conspicuously avoid military service during the Vietnam War? 
Was that true of Cheney? Yes, sir. Well, I, I, I didn't know that. You sure of that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, okay. No, I mean, I'll take your word for it. Huh? What would you give a do? Go ahead. Norman. Yeah. Norman. Yeah, well, this issue, of course, arose in a big way over Dan Quayle when he was uh, uh, chosen by Bush. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of heated uh, discussion, some of it uh, quite comical, uh, if you were of a mind to be amused, uh, in which uh, people were writhing about people who had themselves been very proud of evading the draft during Vietnam and suddenly attacking uh, Quayle for having done so on the theory that he wasn't entitled uh, uh, to, um, uh, to evade uh, uh, the draft. Um, what can I say? I mean, I think that uh, my own view is that, uh, that uh, we will never, ever uh, achieve a true health as a political culture until we honestly confront uh, the, uh, the experience of Vietnam. And we are very, very far from having done so, not just on this particular point, but on a, on a whole range of uh, questions about uh, who uh, actually did what to whom, and uh, not, as well as who said what about what uh, and why. And, uh, uh, because the uh, the meaning of that uh, of that episode uh, continues to be deliberately obscured, and I agree from all sides, uh, I think we remain uh, uh, arrested in uh, in attitudes and uh, guilts and uh, uh, forms of uh, of uh, of moral righteousness that are. Uh, unearned and in some cases uh, 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 almost uh, criminally inappropriate. Uh, one does the best one can. I mean, uh, <laughs> we have to, I think, people get bored with Vietnam, except, of course, I, to my amazement, I see that Born on the Fourth of July is the number one box office hit. I haven't yet been able to bring myself to see the movie. Uh, but evidently, the myth, the myth of Vietnam remains uh, one of the uh, uh, unshakable uh, pieties uh, of the political culture. And I do believe that is a moral and political and spiritual uh, disaster for this country. Yes. For whom is your question? Yes. Well, go ahead. Um, I think we need this. Harvard is studying at Harvard, and I guess one of the main factors for being a creative person is to be able to tolerate ambiguity. And I have a sense that each person in there has moved toward a hardening of a position. And does that, in some way, stop your own creativity? You're asking me? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, let's let's get. Uh, I think uh, Hilton, you or or Peter Brooks, do you want to try that one? Well, I belong to the generation that was brought up on seven types of ambiguity, uh, and uh, the answer to your question is no. It hasn't stunted my creative growth. Peter Brooks, I thought the question was suggesting that ambiguity was a good thing. Uh, in, in seven yes, doses I, oh, yes, or, or, or I agree. less. I agree it's a good thing, and my saying mine hasn't been stunted. <laughs> yes. wants to try that one? Well, I'll try it. Um, I think it's uh, a small but happy sign of uh, moral and intellectual health, but it's only a dot on the horizon, I regret to say. Yes, you had your hand up. Yes.
and other media which influence our society now have in them people that can be considered as intellectuals in what they're doing. Richard Sam. Well, I can't, I can't respond to your last, because uh, I haven't seen this well, film either. But uh, let me respond to the first part of, of what, what you're saying. Um, um, I, I'm very uncomfortable with the word uh, intellectual. I think there's, there is activity which is, involves the use of one's intellect. Uh, it may be the fact that I went to a... Um, uh, just almost by accident to a university uh, in which uh, the use of intellect was presumed to be lifelong and there was nothing else uh, worth doing. This is the old University of Chicago, which was uh, uh, a, um, either a cloister or a madhouse or, or both. Uh, but I'm very uneasy about the notion of the intellectual or th that there is a class of the intellectuals. This oftentimes seems to me to be real, real uh, construction into the work of reflection is something that I think generally human beings do and, and let's hope with with more and more intelligence about people who who make their living by writing their ideas and, and uh, uh, by serving it as uh, as as a kind of class that thinks of that as its work, you know, as something that actually is what they do day in and day out. I think there's been a terrific change. And I was trying to indicate before what I, I, I think some of the reasons for it are. Um, economically, there's been a terrific change in our culture so that most of those people are involved with late adolescents and early adults. That's the experience that orchestrates their lives over and over and over again. Uh, there's a loss of a kind of adult discourse in other words, about ideas. But you can't possibly mean that there's more teaching going on in the great universities than there used to be. No, I mean, no, I, I'm not talking about that at all. I'm saying that your question is, I think, addressed to kind of, when I think in my own field, one of the, its greatest practitioners, a man named Schutz, was an insurance salesman. He wrote privately, is, uh, is probably the, probably one of the greatest social theorists America uh, produced between the two wars, it would be inconceivable today. He was a man who had no contact with young people. Uh, he had a contact, he's like, uh, I don't know why they're all insurance salesmen. I'm just thinking Ives and, well, uh, Stevens. and Stevens. <laughs> it must be something about insurance that's good for the mind. But I, that I can't tell you. But what I'm trying to indicate to you is that that's, that's a kind of change. You know, if you spend all of your time with late adolescents, that's... <coughs> about thinking, you know, or the instruction of late adolescence, gradually what you produce is adolescent thinking. And it's, <laughs> it's that kind of, it's that kind of structural change, which I think is, is uh, as important as the kind of issues that, that you're, you're raising, Hilton, but these are not political. They have to do with the material way in which people who spend their time as professional intellectuals. Well, I think what work. you've said is indeed uh, tremendously uh, important, and it does give me a, um, an insight I perhaps hadn't had before into the sort of um, arrested adolescence of a great many academic minds. <laughs> but I don't think that that precludes the encapsulating political culture that nonetheless defines the academic life today. I mean, it's not an either or question. Mm -hmm. But I think you have, if I may say so, I think you, you, you make it rather, a, um, rather more unitary than it is. I, I tell you, most of the students I teach, their political attitudes are much closer, and, and cultural attitudes are much closer to, to yours than they would be of the, the people you see. Oh, oh uh, I'm not talking about uh, the students. All right. I'm yeah. talking about the teachers. Yes, and even there, you and, know, it isn't, it isn't all a uniform. It, it, I, I mean, there's a, yeah, I just, I just, but I just, let me just yeah. finish about this. I think precisely the, the, the error in, 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 in that is to assume that, that the uh, 60s spawned a kind of unitary culture of, of, of academics. 
it spawned a lot of confusion, which has created a lot of different, by now these are people, they're people my age, they're people in their, in their middle 40s, and they're very confused. Well, try crossing it and see what yeah. happens to you. Yeah. Uh, could I, could I give a, could I give a, oh, I'm sorry. Well, no, let, Peter was I, I just wanted to call Hilton Kramer also on this myth that academia is dominated by uh, a monolithic uh, left liberal bloc. It has changed in the way that the outside culture has changed. And I think that you would uh, find ideas that you have espoused uh, very popular within the academy uh, as without the academy. Uh, so I think what, one thing that I cannot understand in both commentary and new, new criterion is this relentless onslaught uh, on the universities as if they were uh, still bastions of the 60s in their social attitudes and their, their philosophies. Uh, taint true. Well, Peter, it's the sheer, based on the sheerest empiricism. <laughs> uh, uh, believe me, I would be happy to find it otherwise. Uh, but uh, the kind of remark that you made about uh, 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 President Reagan in, in your opening uh, talk um, is to me the exact uh, a kind of uh, archetypal cliche of the academic attitude toward uh, politics today, that is um, a, an actor for whom other people wrote the script. Uh, now, that's a remark that goes over terrifically big in, in the academy. I know. I've, I've, I actually have had quite a lot of experience in the academy. Um, there would be, it reminds me of that great remark of, of, um, of Pauline Kael after Nixon, uh, you know, won his big landslide. And she said, I can't understand how he got elected. I don't know anybody who voted for him. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's... Outside the academy, it's even possible for people to believe that um, Ronald Reagan was somebody who articulated a very concrete political program. Uh, twice in large numbers, the American people liked what he said and voted on it. He implemented it, and they liked him all the more for it. I mean, nobody wrote his script. He had been writing that script in California for years before he became president. But that's a kind of academic reduction of the political culture of the universities. You don't have to identify all of academia with me. <laughs> One more question. I'm an empiricist. <laughs> that's, yes. That's two cases. That's bad empiricism. <laughs> you only get a statistically significant sample. I want to tell you this when you have six. So you oh, need to okay. know four more academics for this. <laughs> well, I, you may have your chance. I'm not sure that I understand uh, the, the intention of the question. You mean, should American intellectuals have been required to uh, go on trial like Brasillac and, and be shot for their ideas? You remember it was Duke... It was de Gaulle who said at the end of the Second World War, when he was asked uh, to pardon Brasillac, he said, no mercy for the intellectuals. Anyone was, else want to? It was also de Gaulle who said about uh, uh, arresting Sartre that you don't, you don't arrest uh, Voltaire, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, it was Voltaire, I think. Um, I, I would uh, myself like to see all intellectuals held up before the bar of opinion for uh, the things they have written and said about important issues. Uh, you say, of course, but it is rarely done, and when it is done, uh, one is excoriated for doing it, uh, as, I can, uh, as I can testify from repeated personal experience. 
this is part of what uh, some of us have been trying to say. Uh, the, it is enormously important for these accountings to be made. They are rarely made. Uh, I, look, I turned on a television set the other night flipping with the remote control and I came upon a discussion on C-SPAN. Forgive the unreconstructed Cold War references here, but there was a, a discussion, solemn discussion going on from Harvard, the Kennedy School, um, uh, of, and it was in the uh, memory of uh, Teddy White, uh, who of course had written about China early in his career. And so they had uh, discussion of uh, his contribution to uh, our understanding of China, and there were people, his mentors and admirers, and they're sitting on the platform, being treated with great reverence by everybody present was John K. Fairbank. Now, if I brought you a list of the things John K. Fairbank said, I mean, if I were John K. Fairbank, I would be too ashamed ever to open my mouth again on virtually any subject, let alone China. But of course, no one says this about Fairbank, and if you said it, you would be accused of McCarthyism or vindictiveness or unreconstructed Cold War. And there he is, uh, the Dean of American Chinese Studies. There were a few other people in the audience uh, on the panel uh, of similar uh, stripe. I think this makes for a very unhealthy intellectual life and a corrupt culture. And I think those accountings ought to be made. Um, I'd like to comment on that uh, on that question too, because while I take it your uh, question was asked in a, a facetious vein, I nonetheless take it, the question very seriously. That is, the implication of your question is that we're um, out to uh, humiliate people and uh, line them up against the wall and, and publicly punish them in some way. Um, I think that to assume that is a profound moral failure on your own part, I may say. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you a story apropos of your question. Um, some years ago, uh, when I uh, was still persona grata uh, in such quarters, I was seated at a dinner party next to uh, Susan Sontag. And um, I, uh, I mean, Susan and I had disagreed publicly and privately about many matters uh, over the years. And so naturally, I, you know, I was trying to act like a, a civilized person. And so what does one writer ask another? What are you working on? And she said, um, well, I'm writing a long essay that is an answer to Paul Hollander's book, Political Pilgrims. Now, Political Pilgrims, which many people in this audience will know, is an account of uh, Western European American intellectuals, an account of their um, travels in, in uh, communist countries and the rosy uh, um, uh, accounts they brought back from Soviet Union, China, Cuba, etc. And indeed, uh, Susan figures rather significantly in certain chapters of the book. She said, "I I feel we, uh, that he he uh, Hollander can't be allowed to get away with it." Well, I thought this was a very interesting th uh, and brave thing for her to undertake. We're still waiting for it. She has never done it. And my prediction is she'll never do it. And that is really the answer to your question. There really is, there was not only a great deal of bad faith in what she wrote uh, uh, in a trip to Hanoi and about uh, the uh, Cuban revolution, there continues to be a great deal of bad faith. Uh, in her reluctance to address what she wrote in the light of history. I'd like to leave the last word with either Richard Sennett or Peter Brooks so that they wouldn't feel that somehow they'd been ganged up on. <laughs> no, I don't feel that. I'm against who is a gang? <laughs> <laughs> it's not nearly a statistic. I speak to the feelings, not to the mind. Yes. No, I... I, um, I 
what I'm sorry that we have not uh, talked about uh, tonight is actually what um, uh, what um, constitutes the kinds of uh, issues that um, uh, would would create a different kind of uh, um, what, what kind of what kinds of changes we would like to now see occur in our society? The relationship of, of if you, we must use that word intellectuals to those changes and so on. Um, I suppose I speak very very um, personally about this. Um, uh, I, I think for everyone who's had a, uh, as, as as you know, as I my family have had a, a, a bad encounters with. Uh, Communism. The one, the one thing that one takes away from it is that, and the recovery from from those uh, encounters, is that somehow one must find a kind of vision of some other way to live. And uh, they're in some way the most. I, again, I'm speaking very personally about this, but uh, uh, you know, a justified. Uh, um, Anger is one of the most oppressive things a human being carries. Uh, I don't. I see a settling of accounts. Uh, I, I understand what you're both talking about, and it's it, it's rational. It makes sense. But beyond that, there is a there is another kind of intellectual work, and uh, it's a work of creating something, uh, and uh, that we we have not uh, touched. Peter Brooks. I, I do think that this panel this evening has been somehow symptomatic of how public intellectual life is blocked in this country. And with Dick Sennett, I, I share a feeling that uh, we need to move forward and that there need to be uh, acts of discrimination and acts, uh, how shall I put it, in the sociology of knowledge and how we got to our present uh, division between the academic world and urban intellectuals. These need to go forward uh, unblocked. Uh, we need to get beyond the terms of the debate as they've been put here. And I, I'm, I'm sorry that the evening has had so few acts of intellectual discrimination to characterize it, really. Well, in any event. <laughs> I, will, I will only say that I hope that the next time, if ever, we meet on this subject, though I hope that we will one day, that each person will have with him a bumper crop of names of public intellectuals who can be pointed to with pride and whose praises can be sung. In any case, thank you all for coming. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.